Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. It's raining and for some reason I seem to have a lot of free stitching time this afternoon. So I thought it might be a nice idea to sit down and do something just a little bit different to what I normally do. Um, and just maybe do a slightly different stitch with me. And instead of just, um, you know, talking freely as I normally do, I thought I might talk about something which really interests me. And I have many interests, as some of you know, um, but one of the main ones is history. And whilst I'm not a historian, I am a historical fiction novelist. I do love um, reading about history and different people and different places. I'm reading several books at the moment, and one of them is, of course, yet another about my favourite queen, Mary Queen of Scots. I always love reading about her. She fascinates me in a way that I cannot really comprehend. I think about her life. I think about her life story a lot. And I think that's probably fueled by the fact that not just because I live in her country, but I live very close to all the places that she lived in herself. So I think it would be quite natural to take an interest in what happened so many years ago in the place that you live. And so I thought it'd be nice to give a brief review of her life and hopefully you'll find something interesting there. If you have no interest whatsoever, well, I don't mind at all. No hard feelings. Um, it's, <laughs> it's perfectly okay to exit. Don't worry, there'll be other general Stitch With Me's too where I talk about, you know, the more mundane stuff. So I'm going to continue with my stitching on Riverwalk Charm and um, tell you a little bit about this fascinating character from so many years ago. Okay, so I'm going to add some photos along the way as well, I think. Some of the photos that I'm adding I took myself and some of them are just the more standard portrait photos that, um, that, that are in the public domain, uh, you know, the Wiki Commons images. So they're generally marked as fair use. So Mary was born in 1542 in Scotland. And my goodness, I just figured out that was 481 years ago, which is actually pretty scary when you think about it. Um, very long time ago. And she inherited the crown of Scotland at just six days old. So she was basically just a week old when her father, King James, suddenly died. And at that time, because Mary was just a baby, they had what was called regents governing Scotland. You know, these stuffy looking males that were very austere and ambitious, get together in Parliament and try to govern the country and, you know, debate everything that they had to debate politically, religiously. And of course, during this time, there was always the constant threat of English forces invading the country. And the political climate, to be fair, was always pretty hairy during the medieval period. I mean, I don't think you can go back to any history book and not see a battle somewhere. So because she was so young, her mother decided during one invasion that she would just send her daughter to France for safety, as you do, you know, hand her over to your siblings or some of your family in a different country and say, hey, look after her because there's a lot of hairy, scary stuff going on here in Scotland at the moment and we don't want her to come to any harm. She was only a young girl of about six years of age by then because, you know, the wars go on for a few few years. And she sent Mary across to, to France because Henry VIII had decided that he wanted her to wed his only son, Edward. Now, if you know anything about Henry, he was a very determined king. And he was used to just about get, getting anything he wanted whenever he wanted so he wasn't very happy with a uh, no for an answer however mary's mother wasn't that keen on the idea of marrying her daughter off to king henry the eighth's son and i don't i can't say i blame her to be honest <laughs> 
because we all know what a tyrant Henry was. He had a reputation for beheading some of his wives. I'm also fascinated by Henry, I have to say, but he had a terrible reputation for beheading some of his wives. And by the time Mary was born, he'd already chopped off two of them, Catherine Howard and Anne Boleyn. So Mary's mother, Queen Mary's mother, wasn't keen on the idea of him being Mary's father-in-law, and I can fully agree with her. But before she reached France, an agreement was made and Mary was betrothed to the King of France's son, called Francois, which made her, or would, have made, would make her, not only the Queen of Scotland, but also a consort Queen of France. So this girl is going places back in those days. Um, titles meant a big thing. Uh, high ranking royalty was a big thing. And to have her marry the French king's son was, you know, a good prospect. It was a good prospect for her. But I can't help but think of what a huge burden this would be, you know, on the shoulders of a young girl, right? So she had grown up in a world cosseted by luxury, every need met, and she was also a political pawn. And when she did get married, she was, you know, basically forced to sign treaties and documents, which she didn't really understand at her young age, which would get her into a lot of trouble later on uh, with the English Queen. But, um, yeah. So here's a picture, anyway, of Francois, very dashing looking man. He was young. He was young. She was young. I mean, they probably felt that they would have a bright future of, ahead of them. Um, he was a sweet looking boy by the looks of it. He looks like you could just take his clothes off, putting him in a denim jacket and a pair of, you know, a pair, a pair of loafers and he would just suit. He would fit well in to the, the modern day, wouldn't he? <laughs> but they used to wear these very fancy clothes and you know the more fancy the better I think so there was her husband to be however let's just fast forward a few more years and um, during this time when she was living in France and she was you know learning how to become a queen of France and she wrote letters back and forth to her mother in Scotland one of these letters I saw myself uh, an exhibition here in Edinburgh it was beautiful to see it, it completely floored me I walked up to the um, National Museum where they had an exhibition of Mary Queen of Scots they had some of her letters many artifacts many of her belongings and one of them was a letter that she had written to her mother from France telling her mother how happy she was to be in France and to be crowned a queen and how much she adored uh, Francois her husband to be and um, it was just so sweet to see this letter obviously I couldn't take photographs of it they would not allow cameras into the venue but it was it felt like such a privilege to be able to see something like that so during this time she was you know she had a whole future ahead of her she was happy she got on well with him they were basically underage children, to be honest. So it, it was said to be unlikely that their marriage was ever consummated, but they had become close companions and they were very happy together. But this is the point where it all starts to unravel and tragedy strikes. And in 1560, when Mary reached the age of 17, her mother suddenly dies back in Scotland. And not long after that, her husband, Francois, the boy king also dies. He always had suffered fragile health, apparently, but he died from uh, an ear infection. So it must have been incredibly painful back then because, yeah, they didn't have, you know, the medicine that we have today. So it couldn't have been nice for him. And it was certainly probably very awful for poor Mary. So after his death, Francois's mother Catherine de Medici, which you probably heard that name, decides that she's got no more use for Mary. I mean, you know, she was the queen consort of Francois, but Francois is now dead and she has other children that she can, you know, that will uh, inherit the throne. So what to do with Mary? Not much. She doesn't want her around, apparently. So Mary decides to return to Scotland, which unfortunately for her 
was vastly growing into a Protestant nation. So Mary, being a Catholic, well, she wouldn't exactly have impressed her Scottish lords. Um, and neither did England's religiously reformed country seem to delight in her returning either, because we have to remember that Elizabeth, the Queen of England, was also a Protestant. And even though Mary was allowed to practice her faith in private within her palace, it wasn't ideal that she was, you know, such a devout Catholic during this time. So this is a photograph of the original portrait painting, which I took myself when I was inside the palace and inside her chambers. And this one is of Mary actually in her mourning clothes when she was mourning the death of her mother. Um, she looked very sad. It must have been a terrible time for her. And she decided that she was going to return to her country and her main residence in Scotland at that time was called the Palace of Holyrood House and I've been inside Holyrood House a number of times and I've taken some photographs of the many interior rooms and it's absolutely amazing to see and um, even nicer than that it's actually a stone's throw from where I live well, it's about a 20 to 25 minute walk from my home. Depends how fast you walk. I don't walk very fast, so I would say for me about 25 minutes. But I also love the fact that I'm really close to her main Scottish residence and I can, you know, at any time go down there and just think about her and take a look around. So here's a picture of the, some of the pictures that I took actually of inside Hollywood. Um, and here's a picture of a bed we're probably very familiar with seeing this type of four poster bed um the throne room and there's also a hanging portrait of mary inside her bedchamber which i found really fascinating to see as well but this palace was literally a hotbed of dramatic events for mary this was the part of her life for me is when all the interesting aspects of her life actually begin because they're also very sad and I think it's the emotion in them the turmoil that that makes the story what it is and of all the books I've read about her I found that the accounts tend to vary on her character it depends on who did the historical research and if I'm looking back and and reading documents which were written by people you know during the con contemporary times during her lifetime you might clearly see who was her supporter and who was her enemy but some historians I think paint her out to be an emotional queen saying that she would make decisions through the passions of her heart rather than the mind and you know there were many who didn't think that women were fit to rule at the time and others would say, no, wait, she's, she's shrewd, she's smart, and she had designs on obtaining the throne of England as well as Scotland. So the throne of England would have been, by way of royal bloodlines, uh, Mary would have had a right to the succession, and she would have had a right to sit on the English throne. But of course, her cousin, Queen Elizabeth I, did not want to give it to Mary. Queen Elizabeth I didn't even want to name a successor. So having Mary around in Scotland was a danger now, not only because of her proximity to the English crown, which was a threat, a direct threat to Elizabeth, but also Mary's Catholicism stirred up plots and rebellions by many Catholic sympathizers in England. So the fact that they were family as well as queens just made it really complicated, right? Because if you're a queen and your sister or your cousin is another queen and she's on, on, on an island beside you and OK, so you may be fond of her and you may love her, but she has designs on taking your crown uh, as well as hers or, or does she? You know, I mean, I, I, in all the correspondence Mary had with Queen Elizabeth, she would, you know, profess her love for her 
sister queen. They called each other sisters, but they weren't really sisters. They were more first cousins. But she would profess her love and to Queen Elizabeth and, you know, and, and say that, you know, she supported her and that she would never, never want to steal the throne from her. Although she did say that she wanted to be named a, a, as heir to Elizabeth because that was her birthright. But, um, you know, there was a sort of tension between them, I think, when you read the correspondence, even though they would support each other for many years. Um, so Mary was actually well received at first. When she came into, into Edinburgh, she went on a progress, progress up the Royal Mile. Um, and if you walk up the Royal Mile today, you'll see it looks very medieval still. Um, beautiful very period buildings. And she was actually well received by the people, you know, she was their queen. They wanted to see her. They had never seen her for years. She was, she came back, but she was also trouble. There was no doubt about that. She wanted to be liked. She wanted her subjects to love her. It was a very difficult time for her as a devout Catholic to come to her country, which was already practicing, had already reformed. There was um, many Protestants within the palace. Many of her lords were Protestants and they had great powers. They had more power than she did at the time. So it was very difficult for her to kind of slot in and find her place, continue to practice her religion, which was frowned upon. They let her do it, but it was frowned upon. And, um, you know, she she had to find her place. She had to sort of show that she was in charge, but she didn't want to upset anybody. John Knox was a Protestant minister at the time and he used to uh, give his sermons and literally, you know, rant and, and about Mary saying that she was not fit to be a queen, that she was um, basically calling her a prostitute, that she would, that she just came into Scotland, came into her palace and would, you know, indulge in frivolous activities. Mary, of course, would take offence at this, and there was a meeting between John Knox, um, who was not very liked, but he was also very powerful in the country, and she would ask him, you know, why he persisted in def defaming her, why he persisted in r trying to ruin her, and um, he basically, it all boiled down to the fact that he just did not think that women should rule, that women should not be queens, women shouldn't be rulers. And he wrote a book called The First Blast of the Trumpet Against the Monstrous Regiment of Women. And this was basically uh, an uncompromising attack against the rule of women at the time. I'm pretty sure for something like that, um, Mary would have probably wanted to, you know, have him arrested for treason and beheaded or executed uh, for his for his actions but he was so powerful in Scotland at the time that if she was to do something like that she would just create even more animosity amongst her people. So thinking about this what we had then at that time was we had a queen come back to her country which she had left many years ago. Um, her main language by now would have been French because she went to France at the age of six. So even though she spoke Scots, she, would, she conversed in French to her ladies and to other members of her court. Um, there was a great degree of political unrest, religious upheaval. And to have all that carried on your, upon your shoulders at such a young age must have been incredibly difficult for, for the young queen. The only thing that was expected from her at this point was to marry and produce an heir. And Mary didn't oppose this. She, she very much wanted to, to, you know, marry somebody suitable and, and to have a child. But she also wanted to be accepted and loved by her people. Unfortunately, the choices that she makes for the rest of her life impact the country and herself very badly and it's um unfortunately it's not a very nice uh not a very nice path that mary trod on after after coming back to scotland and i feel like you know things would have been could have been very different if only her husband in france hadn't died if only her mother had survived a bit longer she would have had 
that backbone of support she would have maybe had different advisors um i feel that many of the much of the advice she had came from untrusting untrustworthy lords and and members of the of the council and i think that didn't help her case either so i think i'm going to leave that there because there's a lot to digest even in you know a small fraction of, of a story like this and when I come back I think I might just talk about her ridiculously cocky and unlikable second husband Lord Darnley and the tragedy that befell him. I will also show you a photograph I took inside Holyrood House of the place where Mary's secretary was murdered by her husband and there is a stain of blood or said to be a stain of blood actually it's not a real stain of blood it's <laughs> it's a very modern stain of probably red wine but you know it's very nice for the tourist industry to tell them that it's it's the blood of the of the murdered secretary in her in her chambers so I hope that you found something interesting here and I'd love to hear what you think of, of the story of Mary, Queen of Scots. And do you think that she was just a poor, you know, woman who was antagonised and thrust into, a, into a, a world of politics and intrigue and all these nasty things that go along with, with being such an important person, a ruler of a country? Or do you think that she was a game player? Do you think that she uh, knew what she was doing and she just wanted to grab everything that she that was well that she had a right to really she wanted the crown of England as well as the crown of Scotland yeah I'd be interested to find out what you think so thanks for watching and I'll see you again soon <laughs>